Right. So I want to talk to you a little bit more about how um, blood travels through your circulatory system and at least give you an introduction to it. I'm going to again talk about the heart. Start with the heart again. And so the heart is about the size of your fist. And it's going to be a little bit on the left side of your body. In fact, it points a little bit towards your left hip. And there, and it's separated. This is a four-chambered heart being a mammalian or a mammal. You know, hair, warm-blooded, live birth, and so forth. And so... There is what we call a deoxygenated side of the heart and an oxygenated side of the heart. Now, in this picture, you'll see that it looks blue, but in real life, it's not blue. They just do that to help you to know that one side is deoxygenated and the other side is oxygenated. It's just going to be a dull red color versus a bright red color in regards to the blood. The reason why you might look like your veins are blue for instance, it's only more, that's, I wouldn't call it an optical illusion, but it's a physics kind of question that has to do with your skin layers and so forth. It gives the veins an, a, a blue appearance. In fact, your blood is actually red. The only kind of blue blood that you would see would be something like a horseshoe crab or some of those kind of animals that have copper to carry oxygen. Our hemoglobin, if you remember, hemoglobin, and we'll get into it a little bit later, is a protein that's found in red blood cells. And around a billion hemoglobins are in each red blood cell known as an erythrocyte. <clears throat> Obviously, blood is important for moving, and we'll, we'll get into more details about blood, but it's important for um, pH regulation, osmoregulation, um, temperature regulation, transporting hormones, um, transporting and getting rid of waste, and obviously tra pushing nutrients around and oxygen and so forth. So that's the function of blood. Now, um, remember, blood is composed of not just blood cells like erythrocytes, but it's also made up of plasma, the watery layers or, or solution that the blood cells are floating around. There's red blood cells and white blood cells. We call those leukocytes. The white blood cells have an immune function, like uh, there might be macrophages or and so forth. And then there's also um, platelets running around in your blood. Platelets are fragments of cell membranes made from megakarocytes. And so we'll get into all that a little bit later in more detail. But realize, again, looking at your heart, the right side of my heart, even though it might look like it's on the left side when you're looking at me, but the right side of my heart is the deoxygenated blood. That blood will actually travel to the lungs. And so let me get into a little bit more about the structure of the heart. So let's imagine that you had, talking about your big toe, and we're going to trace the blood traveling through our, our body. The big toe um, the, has been, you know, the metabolism has been taking place in the muscles and tissues of your toe, and the waste products are all entering into the blood plasma. This might include urea for breaking down nitrogen, and it has lipids and all sorts of stuff, but it also will have carbon dioxide. And it also has some, quite a bit of oxygen in it, unless you're in, in a situation where you're really starved for oxygen. There's still oxygen even in the deoxygenated blood. And as it travels up the veins, because blood veins is what returns blood to the heart, it will eventually reach a structure called the vena cava. And you can see this in this picture here. The vena cava has two sides to it. It has an inferior vena cava, and a superior vena cava. The inferior end of vena cava is where the blood will come from, um, from below your heart, usually. So your legs, your abdomen, most of the blood will return through the inferior vena cava, just the, which is shown in this picture here. Now, if it's coming from your shoulders or your head, 
that's going to enter through the superior vena cava or, and travel into the superior vena cava. But ultimately, it all will return to a chamber called the right atrium. So the right atrium um, is obviously on the top of the heart. It's a chamber that's filled with um, will fill up with blood, and then the cardiac muscle will squeeze it, squirting the blood into the right ventricle. This is actually happening on the left side as well. The left atrium is filling up with blood and squeezing its contents into the left ventricle. But we're just going to focus on one half of the heart right now. So the right atrium squirts the blood into the right ventricle. The right ventricle will contract and actually close tricuspid valves. If I um, zoom out, you'll see the tricuspid valve. I'm gonna try to zoom out. But the tricuspid valves is right between, as the little valves are sticking out right between the right atrium and the right ventricle. You see how they're kind of protruding in this picture? The little, um, show. I'm trying to get a cursor on it. So it's a little projection. You see that? Those will close, snap shut, when the right ventricle closes. So when they snap shut, that's what causes the beat, the heartbeat, the lub-dub sounds, is those valves shutting. So when the ventricle squeezes, the valve will shut. It's a one-way valve, so that's the, the, what the, these valves are important for. So the tricuspid valve will shut. Then the blood will be squirted for lack of a better word, I suppose, ejected um, through these pulmonary valves as you travel. So follow the blue arrow. It will travel up to the um, pulmonary um, artery going towards the lungs. Does that make sense to everybody so far? So these valves right here, are the pulmonary valves. This is the pulmonary artery. So let me use my pointer. So this is the tricuspid valves. Blood will be squirted in from the right atrium into the right ventricle. The right ventricle will contract and squirt the blood through these uh, pulmonary valves. Again, these are all one-way valves into the pulmonary artery, and then it'll travel to the lungs. When you hear the word pulmonary, realize that means essentially has something to do with the lungs. From there, the blood will travel to the lungs and become oxygenated. We'll get into more of that later, but basically the arteries get turned into atrioles, which are small arteries, and then that gets turned down into capillaries. And then they return back through venules and veins and so forth. Arteries, the main job of arteries is, again, transporting blood away from the heart, irrespective of if it's oxygenated or deoxygenated. So when you put your fingers on, have you ever felt your pulse? When you feel your pulse, you're feeling you're feeling an artery. When you feel it on your hand, you're feeling an artery. The artery expands like a balloon, so it's stretching and, re and then retracting. It's much thicker than veins and more elastic. So the blood goes to the lungs. So we're tracing this, we're tracing the blood right now. It's going to the lungs, goes through some capillaries. We call them alveoli, and we'll get into that in the lungs later, where it gets the gas exchange takes place. Carbon dioxide is released and oxygen comes in. 
Then, as I mentioned, the, the blood returns back to the heart. This time it comes back through pulmonary veins, which is over here. The pulmonary veins returns it to the left atrium. The left atrium contracts, pushing the blood into the left ventricle. Notice how much bigger and thicker the left ventricle is, the muscles, the cardiac muscles. The left ventricle will contract, pushing the blood through the aortic valve and closing these bicuspid valves. The bicuspid valves are also known as mitral valves. And then the blood will squirt through this um, aortic valve into the aorta and then out through the various arteries through the rest of the body. That's the systemic circulation. So that's tracing it. And then it'll come back through wherever it goes. It'll come back to the superior or inferior vena cava and do and follow the course again. Does that make sense to everybody? So the blood travels through the atrium, right atrium, right ventricle, through the the uh, right pulmonary valves or the pulmonary valves, pulmonary arteries to the lungs, goes out to the to the left ventricle, goes through the bicuspid valves, also known as the mitral valve, to the left ventricle. The left ventricle contracts, pushes the blood through the um, aortic valves right here, and then out to the aorta, and then out through to the body. And so that's what this picture is showing you here. See the blue, these blue veins, I'll put it back in play mode. These blue veins are returning the blood through the vena cava to the right side of the heart, the right atrium, then to the right ventricle, then through the pulmonary arteries to the lungs, then back through the pulmonary veins to the left atrium, then through the left ventricle through the bicuspid valves, then through the aortic valves, and then out through the aorta to the rest of the body, through the arteries. And all the blood will return via veins. Now, there are some places where the veins, where capillaries can become arteries and then go back to veins and all kinds of things like that, like blood or something, those kind of things. But this is, in a general sense, how blood travels through your circulatory system, in a nutshell, of course. Here's another picture of the heart again. Again, you can see this is the vena cava. We have the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. Blood's returning from the body through either the inferior vena cava or the superior vena cava into the right atrium. The right atrium fills up. The right atrium contracts. Remember there's pacemaker cells that do this. They give off an electrical discharge. Remember how I described that last time? Relax lecture. I don't know if I went into a lot of detail, but I kind of mentioned it. And then the blood is squirted from the right atrium into the right ventricle, and these tricuspid valves close as the right ventricle contracts. Now, this is happening at the same exact time with the left atrium and left ventricle. So the top part of the heart contracts, bottom heart part 
of the heart contract. Top part contracts, bottom part contracts. Then the blood is squirted into the pulmonary arteries through the pulmonary valves out to the lungs. And then the arteries go down to atrials, the atrials go down to capillaries and what they call alveoli, back to venules and veins, and then back to the left side of the heart through pulmonary veins, through the left atrium, then through bicuspid valves that we call the mitral valve. Then the blood is squirted into the left ventricle. The left ventricle squeezes the blood through the um, aortic valve into the aorta, and then it goes out through the body. And it'll either, and then also go through the descending aorta. aorta. Now, notice on these valves, the bicuspid valves and the tricuspid valves, there's these little extensions or cords of tinea. I think that's how they pronounce it. What do you think those cords do? Those connective tissues, you see them here too. You see that? So this is a valve. The valve moves. Remember to close this? Well, those cords help it to keep it from flipping over. <clears throat> so they're helping hold it in place. So when the ventricle closes them, it doesn't go in reverse. Because remember, this, these valves make sure the blood goes in one direction. So that's what those are doing. Again, notice how much thicker the left side is because it has to push the body, the blood through the whole body. We've already talked about how the um, excitation contraction coupling of skeletal muscles last time. We'll come back to some of this later. Just realize again, there's going to be pacemaker cells that give off an electrical charge that causes the cardiac muscle to contract. We'll talk more about those things at a later lecture too. We talked about this at our last lecture, so make sure to re review that. I want to talk a little bit about arteries and veins now, and then we'll catch up on some of the other slides. This, in a nutshell, is kind of how the, um, again, the circulatory system works. Imagine, though, instead of the heart being right next together, just for the sake of making it easier to review, because we know that there's four chambers, but the two chambers are next to each other. We're just going to take the two chambers and pull them apart to make this diagram. Does that make sense, everybody? So these, the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart are obviously together. This is just another view of how it travels through the body. So if you look at the, we're going to start at the bottom because I like to think of blood coming through the right side. Here you see the veins returning the blood through the the cava, either inferior or superior, goes to the right atrium. The blood then goes through the tricuspid valves into the right ventricle, then through the uh, pulmonary valves into the pulmonary artery. Then it goes into capillaries that are in the lungs. Then it comes, returns back through the pulmonary veins to the left atrium. And then the left atrium contracts and pushes the blood through the mitral into the left ventricle. Then the left ventricle squirts blood into, through the aortic valve into the aorta. Now, remember, the arteries are elastic, so they will expand and help push the blood through like a balloon when you lift have you ever inflated a balloon with water and let go? The balloon squish, helps squirt the water forward, doesn't it? So you fill up a balloon and then you open it, the water's going to squirt. That's what the arteries are helping to do. And when the arteries get smaller, we call those atrials. So small arteries are called atrials. 
Then the atrials will enter into capillaries. Capillaries, again, are kind of like a little thin blood vessel. It is a, it is a tiny little thin blood vessel that allows for blood cells to go in order one by one by one by one. They will then enter into blood vessels called venules, which are basically small veins, and then enter into the veins. And you'll notice that there's also flaps on the veins that are kind of one way, but these are kind of bigger tubes. Now, it's important to move your muscles to help push the blood through your body in the veins. You sometimes wiggle in your legs. That's to help move. It's actually a good thing, even though your mom tells you to stop and now you're self-conscious. <laughs> but the reality is it helps you to keep your body moving and the, muscle, and the blood moving and circulating. And so if these valves break on the, on the veins, they end up, that's what causes the varicose veins that you've probably heard about. So when you get older, some of these, especially from standing or whatever, just getting older, those, vein, those valves will break and then the blood will pool up and you'll make varicose veins. Again, the capillaries is where gas exchange takes place. There's also sphincters found on the atrials that help to shunt, shunt all blood from one group of capillaries to another. Sphincters are made up of small, smooth muscles that can open and close and relax and constrict. And so they can help shuttle blood to different parts of the body. body. If it's cold, they'll shuttle more blood towards the, your inner core, for instance. Here's the basic anatomy of an artery versus a vein. Again, an artery is going to be a lot thicker. It's going to um, be that balloon-like stretching situation. So you have the connective tissue on the outside. Then you'll see this elastic layer of connective tissue. You're going to, or, or more elastic connective tissue, you're going to see smooth muscles, more elastic tissue. You'll see a basal uh, lamina, lamina, and then you'll see the endothelium. And then, the, again, the blood is traveling through that. Now, the veins tends to be bigger and hollower. You'll see that there's a lot less elastic material You'll still have smooth muscles, and you have these valves that help to keep blood moving in one direction. But again, it's going to require some skeletal muscles to help keep that blood moving. As I mentioned before, you can feel your pulse. That is the heart contracting and then causing the arteries to expand and then, and then like the balloon push and we come back down so when you feel the heart when you feel your pulse you're feeling slightly after your heart contracted the ventricles of your heart contract particularly the left ventricle so you can use this to help measure blood pressure so this is looking at blood pressure um, throughout your circulatory system your ventricle, your left ventricle is pushing the blood through your systemic system. And so when it contracts, you'll see blood pressure that can go up to 120, the diastolic pressure. And then in the left ventricle, the blood pressure will drop off dramatically as it refills from the left atrium. When it reaches the arteries, this is when you start to see what we think of as blood pressure. You'll, you'll have a diastolic and a diastolic pressure. Diastolic represents or means when the, the ventricles have contracted. Diastolic is when the ventricles relax. When it relaxes, that is when it's filling up with the new fresh blood from the atrium. So diastolic, again, is ventricle relaxation, filling up, refilling with blood from the atrium then the ventricles will contract and you have this diastolic pressure and it goes back up to 120. As the blood travels through the 
circulatory system, the blood pressure becomes less and less. When it reaches the atrials, the blood pressure has dropped off a lot. When it reaches the capillaries, blood pressure has dropped a lot. And when it reaches the venules and the veins, the blood pressure has dropped dramatically. That's why you need your skeletal muscle to help push the blood back to your heart. You probably, I mean, everybody in here is probably, I'm sure everybody in here has had their blood pressure checked. I mean, it's it's a basically a given, but basically you have a stethoscope and you start to pump up um, the cuff and the nurse or the doctor or health professional of some sort will listen for sounds. Initially, when the blood pressure cuff is added, they'll keep pumping it up to the point where they can no longer hear the blood traveling through your arteries. Then they'll slowly release it, listening. And as soon as they can hear the pulsing sound, that will be what represents the diastolic pressure. For an average healthy blood pressure, that's around 120. Then they'll keep slowly releasing the cuff pressure until they can hear no more sound again. And that represents the diastolic. Remember when the ventricles are relaxing. Obviously, hypertension is when you start getting over 120. Prehypertension and hypertension, which can increase your likelihood of strokes and heart attacks. And that's one of the reasons why we try to get that blood pressure down through medicines and so forth. Um, they refer to the sounds as Kortikoff sounds. Again, vessels like the uh, veins use muscles to help in returning the blood back to the heart because the blood pressure is so low there and there's gravity pulling on the blood. Again, that's one of the reasons why varicose veins can form. This picture here, this diagram here represents the different blood vessels. You can see the arteries are made up of, again, a lot of connective tissue and elastic tissue and smooth muscles in comparison to the other tissues. So looking at the top one, you see the arteries, very thick, lots of elastic materials, blows up like a balloon. And then we go to small arteries called atrioles, and it's mostly smooth muscles and endothelium. Then you go to capillaries, and it's just endothelium. That will allow for the gas exchange to take place. And again, it's so small there the blood vessels pretty much line up in a row to go through. Then the blood will return through the venules, which is basically small veins, and you'll see it's just a, it's mostly a big hollow tube, mostly made up of fibrous tissue and endothelium. And then when you get to the vein, again, it's a hollow tube with a little elastic tissue and smooth muscle and more fibrous tissue. And it has a bigger lumen, lumen being the hole. And again, it has the valves and it requires muscles to help push the blood back. Again, there's also sphincters that help with capillary beds. So you have your atrials going down to the capillaries and then you'll have pre-capillary sphincters, which will are little muscles that can squeeze the capillaries and prevent them from allowing blood to, sh to go through them when needed. This might be important when it's cold. So it'll help shuttle blood away from the surface to the inner core. Or maybe when you're hot, it'll help to open up more capillary beds and help dissipate heat. Or if you're starting to bleed too much, these Pre-capillary uh, sphincters can help prevent you from bleeding as much in those regions. 
So you can see the precapillary sphincters right here. They're, again, they're just round muscles that will close and prevent the blood from traveling in that direction if needed. And, and they're located in different regions. The capillaries is where gas exchange takes place. So now we're looking at a picture of capillaries. There's little cracks between the, um, on the endothelial, well, they're leaky junctions or on the endothelial basement membrane that allows for substances to move through and for gas exchange to take place. But they can also do, um, for bigger proteins and so forth, transcytosis. If you look at the lower right corner, you'll see transcytosis. Hopefully you remember something about endocytosis and exocytosis. Have you ever heard those terms before? Endocytosis is a process in which the cell membrane allows to bring stuff into a cell or out of a cell. Does, does that sound familiar at all from a, a biology class, I hope? If not, it might be worthwhile to take a moment and look up endocytosis or exocytosis on Google. But essentially, this is the cell membrane that you can find here on the muscle cell. You everybody see that on the capillaries? And so the particles will attach. It'll form a vesicle on the inside of the cell made up of the cell membrane. It will travel through the cell membrane, go to the other side, attach as a bubble, and then the membranes will attach, opening up and allowing proteins to exit or whatever large substance. So this is the way capillaries are used to move large substances, proteins, and so forth. Blood moves slowly through capillaries. That allows for gas exchanges to take place. Here are red blood cells lining up as they go through the capillaries. Isn't that kind of a cool picture? So you can see them all lining up. These are red blood cells. Look at the blood pressure to surface area. Again, if you look at the top and look at the bottom, so you see the words going across there, buddy? It says aorta, arteries, atrials, capillaries, venules, veins, and vena cava. And this represents the relative cross-sectional or surface area you'll see um, is much higher for the capillaries. There's lots of surface area for the capillaries. Surface area maximizes the gas exchanges, nutrients, to get rid of the nutrients or gain nutrients or whatever is the case may be. Blood pressure is lowest there, and speed in which it moves is slowest there as well. So blood moving through the capillaries is relatively slow. If you look at the graph below it, you're looking at how fast the blood moves through these regions. If we're talking about the aorta, do you remember the aorta? It's right on top of the heart. It's once it leaves the pulmonary, you know, leaves... Um, from the left ventricle goes into the aorta, from the aortic valve. The blood is moving very rapidly in the aorta. If you get the aorta damaged, you ain't going to make it to the hospital in time. The blood will leak too fast. You're a goner. The blood's moving at 20 eight centimeters per second in the aorta. This is as close to the horror movie scenarios where you see blood squirting. This is as close as it gets to that kind of scenario. The arteries, the blood travels a lot slower in comparison. Maybe we're down to seven centimeters. 
But when we get to the capillaries, we're talking a couple centimeters per second relative to 30 centimeters per second. Then it starts to speed up again once it hits the venules and the vena cava. But again, the surface area is much less for the aortas, the arteries, the veins, and the vena cava. You need the blood to go slower as it travels through the capillaries because that helps, again, in maximizing um, nutrients, absorption, or getting rid of waste, getting the oxygen or whatever. Because remember, the oxygen has to leave the hemoglobin and go to the muscles, which is myoglobin, which is in the muscle. And we'll get into all that a little bit later. One last thing I want to talk about in regards to vessels and the vascular system. We've talked about arteries, capillaries, and veins. There's also the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is a accumulation of vessels on the outside of capillaries that helps to collect water, ex excess water in your tissues. And also it harbors positively um, the immune system. Much of the immune system is found in the lymphatic system. So it helps to dump and return um, water and vessels and anything that leaks out of the cardiovascular system back to the heart. Again, you'll probably, when you're sick, you'll feel your lymph nodes swelling. That's part of the lymphatic system. So again, the lymphatic system is right closely associated with the capillary beds to help reabsorb or for nutrient absorption too. It does do some um, lipids and things like that as well. So the lymphatic system collects around two liters per day of extracellular fluid. That's what the ECF is, excess water. Some people, they get really swollen legs. Some of it is because they aren't able to move as much. They may be getting old. And a variety of reasons, the lymphatic system helps to reduce that swelling slowly, though. Here is the lymphatic system throughout your body. And you'll see there's areas where there's lymphatic um, nodes, often in your armpits or and so forth. Um, pelvis region. Again, this is where a lot of the immune system is located. The, um, I actually had lymphoma, actually, which is a blood cancer, um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I don't, did I tell you about that? But I had a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma about 2007 or so, 2006, 2007. And I had a lymphatic gland that started to swell and get really hard on my neck. So if you ever come to a situation where you have a lymphatic gland that seems to be particularly hard and growing fast, that's a sign that you really want to get that checked from a medical professional, particularly if it's hard and growing fast or any kind of bump like that. In my case, it was a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So my large, I believe my large B cells had become cancerous. And I was quiet an ordeal, actually. So again, it's better than dying to go through the chemo and stuff like that, obviously. At least in my opinion, based on what I know of death and living. <laughs> anyway, does anybody have any questions? Otherwise, I think we are done for now.